Hey everybody, I'm Scott. I'm the teaching pastor here at Shelter Cove Community Church, and I want to welcome you to yet another of our online services as we navigate this uh, weird new world of the coronavirus scare. And many of us are stuck at home and not able to interact in normal ways. And throughout all of that, we are navigating that. We are not ceasing to be the church. Uh, we want you to know that we are praying for all of you. You're on our hearts, on our minds. We, the staff here at the church, and we want to hear from you. We want to know how you're doing, and we want to serve you the best way that we can. And one of the ways that we're trying to serve you is by the creation of our Shelter Cove Church at Home Facebook page. I hope you've been able to check that out, church. Uh, daily, we are posting stuff to that page, uh, encouraging messages, uh, Bible studies, daily devotions, worship postings, uh, and there's some silly stuff on there too. It's also a great way for you to connect with the rest of the body of Christ and the local body here at Shelter Cove. And we just want to let you know that we're not going anywhere. The church is not going anywhere. It's going to take a lot more than some virus to make the church stop being the church. The church has been around a long time, folks. We've been here since Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, since the first century. And there's nothing going to change that. And so because of that, I want you to do what the church does every weekend. We gather and we take the Word of God. Would you open your Bible with me right now? And I want you to turn to Mark chapter 6. You know, last week Pastor Jeremy started a uh, very simple two-week study called Strength in the Storm. Very appropriate for the season that we now find ourselves in. We're in a little bit of a storm, aren't we? It's a storm that's touched the whole world. It's impacted us from a health standpoint. It's impacted us socially. Uh, we are distanced from each other. It's impacted us economically. Uh, many people find themselves out of work or short on income. Uh, a lot of nations find their economies crumbling. So yes, this is a significant storm that we're going through. And we need to know uh, certain things as we navigate that. Now last week, Pastor Jeremy talked about Mark chapter 4 and he shared the story where the disciples and Jesus are there in the boat. Christ is asleep and a storm arises. And they wake Jesus up and He speaks peace to the wind and the waves. And it calms the storm. And it was a great picture of knowing peace through knowing Christ. And you might have heard that message, you might have read that text and thought, okay, lesson learned. Great, let's move on. Well, here we are. Same book, two chapters later, in Mark chapter 6, and we see the disciples in another storm. You say, wait a minute, they were just in a storm in Mark's, Mark 4. You're telling me in Mark 6 they're in another storm? Well, how can that be, Pastor Scott? Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever gone through a hard time in life, a difficult season, and you weather that and you come out the other side and you're okay? Just because you weathered that, does that mean that you're never going to go through anything tough again? Well, no, of course not. We always face challenges in life. It's been said that there's two phases of life. You're either coming out of a storm or you're going into a storm. There really is no other way. Jesus promised us as much. He said, in this world you will have trouble, right? And so we see this pictured here. Two chapters after the last time they were caught up in a horrific storm, the disciples find themselves in a similar situation. It's the relentless return of the difficulties of this world. And like the disciples, we go through storms and there are things that we need to know. And we're going to discover those in our text today. Now this storm and this story comes in the aftermath of one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible, the feeding of the 5,000. Now that's a little bit of a misnomer. There was a lot more than 5,000 that day when Christ supernaturally fed the masses. Uh, they only counted men for some reason in those days. There was likely uh, anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people that Jesus supernaturally fed. Uh, now this happened uh, and it resulted in the peak of his popularity at the time. It's about his third time through the Galilee region. He had traveled to all the various towns around that geographically small yet very populous area. And he had performed miracles, he had preached, he would ministered to people. He had reproduced himself in his disciples, and now they were helping to preach and do miracles and minister to folks as well. And when Christ 
uh, performs this particular miracle of feeding the masses supernaturally, it results in his popularity reaching a fever uh, pitch, okay? Uh, the, the crowd begins to be very rabid, uh, and they, they have decided that this is their guy. And John's Gospel actually says that in the aftermath of the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus perceived that the people wanted to come and take him and make him king by force. And that means that they were ready to revolt, to rebel against Rome. And they had come to the decision that Christ was the leader that they'd been waiting for, that he was the guy to lead that military coup. Why? Well, they'd seen his miracles. Here's a guy that can raise the dead. I mean, they don't need to fear the most uh, fearsome military force in the whole world, the Roman Empire. Why, Rome could kill them? Jesus just raised them from the dead again. No problem. They didn't need to fear that Rome might tax them into poverty. Jesus could feed them. He could fill their bellies to the point of gluttony. This was the guy. And yet Jesus wasn't having any of that. That is not why he had come. And so he shuns that whole idea. He was not there to lead a military coup. And so he departs from the masses. Now, in a future text, he's going to re-encounter this same multitude. And they're going to be looking for the same thing. They want more miracles. They want the leader for their cause. And it's at that point that Jesus is going to say some things to them that will turn them off. And they're going to leave. They're going to leave and, and, and be disgusted. And at that moment, Christ will then turn to His disciples. And He's going to say, what about you? You going to leave too? And these disciples will say, Lord, where would we go? And they're going to commit. And they're going to remain with Christ. And the reason that they're going to make that decision is because of what happens to them in this text right here. And so I want you... In, Matthew, excuse me, in Mark 6, to look at verse 45 as they encounter this whole thing. And uh, we will learn what we need to remember when we encounter a storm. And what we see here in verse 45 is that it says, Immediately He made His disciples get into the boat. Now here's what we need to remember about Christ when we encounter a storm. We need to remember, uh, and if you're following along on the notes that we've provided, we need to remember that Jesus has all authority. He had authority over those disciples. He made them get into that boat. They didn't want to get into the boat. He made them get into the boat by His authority. Uh, he knew that what the crowd was espousing, what they wanted, this military leader, was probably very much in line with what many of these disciples wanted. I think of Judas, I think of Simon the Zealot. This is probably all they have ever wanted. That's probably what drew them to Christ, is the idea that this might be the guy to lead us out of uh, the hands of the Roman Empire. And so he didn't want that for them. He didn't want them infected with this rabid political rally environment that was surfacing, and so he made them get in the boat. He had authority over the disciples. And then we see that he also had authority over the crowd. It says that he dismissed the crowd. Now that's no easy feat. 20,000 people, and they're all worked up into a frenzy, into this political fervor. Listen, you don't just dismiss 20,000 people. You have to have some serious supernatural authority. That's a supernatural act. That's as much a miracle as the feeding of the 5,000, to be able to just disperse a rabid crowd like that. I got four kids. Bedtime at my house is a major undertaking. You understand? Who's with me? Right? I, I, I know if I tell them to get to bed and they go to bed, they're going to come back down and we're going to have to do this whole dance over and over again. It takes quite a while to get them to bed. How I wish that I had the supernatural authority of Christ with my kids and I could just look at them and I could just say, you are dismissed. And they just disperse. Right? But that doesn't happen. I can't handle four. Christ has authority to dismiss 20,000. And so that is the scene. He dismisses the crowd, and He sends His disciples off in this boat without Him. And really, this is, I believe, a picture of the church age, the age in which we live. Those disciples, not, not long before this, He had given them a command, an instruction. He said, feed the multitude, feed the hungry. Well, you and I are modern disciples of Christ. What's His uh, command to us? It's the Great Commission. 
Go and make disciples, uh, teaching them everything I have taught you, right? Give them the gospel. In, in short, feed the hungry. There are spiritually hungry people. We are commanded by Christ to go and to feed them. The 12 disciples here, he puts them in a boat. He sends them out into a world where he's not going to go with them. He, his physical presence is not with them. Is that true for you and I as Christians? We are out in this world and his presence physically is not with us at the moment. These disciples on that sea, they're going to encounter some, some contrary winds that are going to whip up and they're going to turn hostile and they're going to wreak havoc. Can we experience that? Kind of going through that right now, aren't we? And so this is very similar. But when Christ gave us the Great Commission, how did He preface that? He said first, before He said, go and make disciples, He said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. It is the authority of Jesus Christ that precedes everything. And we move forward with that knowledge. And so we need to remember that in the storm, that He has all authority. Okay, and then we need to see uh, in verse 46, what happens next is it says that after He had taken leave of them, He went up on the mountain to pray. And this is the next thing you and I need to remember when we're in a storm. We need to remember in your notes that Jesus intercedes for us. He intercedes for us. Uh, he goes up on that mountain and He prays. And when I say pray, I mean pray. He prays all night long. This is not some one and done flare prayer kind of thing. Jesus goes to the mat for these guys. What is He praying for? Wrong question. Who? Who is He praying for? He's praying for these disciples. He's praying for them. Why? Because if you know the story of the feeding of the multitude, you know that these disciples have a heart condition. They had a faith issue, okay? They did not have faith in the Lord who had demonstrated His faithfulness time and time and time again. And they were skeptical about His ability to feed the crowd. Even when Andrew brings that little boy's lunch and he says, well, we have this, Lord, but what is this among so many? And so they had a faith issue. And so Christ is going up on this mountain and He is praying for them. He is interceding for them. You need to know that whatever you're going through in life, the Lord is interceding for you. He is praying for you. Hebrews 7 says that He always lives to make intercession for those He loves. And we see in Romans 8 that when you and I don't know how to pray as we ought, what happens? The Holy Spirit intercedes for us with, with groans too deep for words. It's in Luke that Jesus says to Peter, He says, uh, Simon Peter, Satan has asked me to let him sift you like wheat. Whoa. Man, if I'm Peter, the next thing I want to hear is, oh, but don't worry, I, I told him no. <laughs> That's not what Jesus says. He says, he's asked to sift you like wheat, but Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail. Jesus knows that we need faith. We need faith like a mustard seed that we can command the mountain and it will throw itself into the sea. We always, always need more faith. And then we, we move on here. We look in verse 47. It says, And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And here's what you need to know in the storm. In your notes, Jesus watches us. He watches us. Not in a, not in a creepy stalker kind of way. <laughs> not in a I got my eye on you, you better not screw up kind of way. No, He is aware of everything that you're going through. He sees it. Sometimes I think we, we feel that way. Does Jesus know what I'm going through? Does God care? Does God know? He sees you. He's aware. He, he, he's not taken off guard by anything going on in your life. He knew it before you did, in fact. But Jesus saw them, and I don't think that we should... Uh, lose sight of that word. He saw them. Where is he right now? He's on a mountain. Where are they? They're in the middle of a lake. They're like four miles offshore. How did he see them? By rights, this should have been out of his sight. Well, he saw them supernaturally. That lake is a dark place at night. I've been there. I stood on my balcony uh, at a hotel in Tiberias overlooking Galilee. And at night, that lake is a black hole. You can see nothing. There's no reason 
logically that Christ should have seen the disciples, which means that he saw them by his divine sight, by his omniscience. He saw what they're going through. And then we need to know in the storm that Jesus comes to us according to his timing. He comes according to his timing. Now, this seems a little hard to swallow when you first look at this story. Here in verse 48, it says, And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. About the fourth watch. What does that mean? The watches of the night were the way that the evening was divided up. Uh, the first watch, uh, culturally, was 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. So each watch is about three hours. First watch, 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Second watch, 9 p.m. to midnight. Third watch, 12 a.m. to 3 a.m. And the fourth watch, 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. When does Jesus come to them? Not until the fourth watch. Watch. He saw them struggling in the early evening. We see that in verse 47. How long does he wait to come to their aid? Up to 12 hours. Why does he wait so long to come to these disciples? Well, how many of you know that Jesus does not always immediately answer our prayers? He doesn't always answer when we want him to. But furthermore, these disciples, as I've said, they had a heart problem. They were lacking in their faith. They had not understood about the fishes and the loaves at the feeding of the 5,000. They had to come to the end of themselves. And Christ allowed them to struggle. And sometimes we need to do that. Sometimes when we find ourselves in a storm, we need to ask the question, what do I need to be learning here? What purpose might this storm serve? Now that doesn't mean that the hardship that you're going through is some sort of punishment by God, that's not what that means, but our God is a sovereign God and He can use anything, any circumstance uh, to fulfill His purpose in your life. What purpose might God want you uh, to fulfill during this season right now? This storm that we're in right now where we're stuck at home, where many of us are suffering, perhaps with our health, perhaps with our time, perhaps with our income, what's, what's, sir, uh, what purpose may you need to learn in this season right here? Maybe while you're stuck at home, God wants you to draw closer to your spouse. Maybe God wants you to invest more in the lives of your family, your children. Maybe God wants you to understand that you don't need to work so much and, and spend so much of your time at work. Maybe God is trying to uh, remove your, uh, your focus from those idols that you've crafted for yourself, the, the material things that you've put a high price on. Maybe you need to use this season to learn how to feed yourself spiritually. Maybe you rely too much on the, on the local church or on a pastor or on another individual for your spiritual sustenance. It may be that a lot of us get our only feeding, spiritually speaking, once a week at the weekend services that we attend. Well, guess what? You need more than that. And now you've got some time and you can learn how to study the Word of God. I did a video on this uh, this week at our Church at Home Facebook page. And I encourage you to check that out. You can learn how to study the Word of God. I give you a very simple plan. And you can develop that discipline in your own life and grow on your own. I think that's what the Lord would want in this season right here. But we can learn through the storm. But He will come to us according to His timing. He does come. And when He comes here, He comes in a very significant way. He walks on the water. He walks on the water. You know, in Jesus' day, the sea represented everything that man could not conquer. It represented the unknown. They didn't know what was down there below the surface. There were no submarines. There was no scuba gear. And so it was a mystery. The Jews were not known as great, great sailors, right? And the sea was intimidating. It was fearful. It was, it was daunting to them. And now it's, it's tempestuous. And so Christ comes and He walks upon it. And it's as if he's communicating to these guys, you take the most tempestuous, most mysterious, most, most befuddling thing, most concerning thing, and I will put it under my feet. And I will tread upon it. I will make it my path. This is just him further asserting his authority. And he comes to them walking on the very object of their fear. He commands the unknown. Our God commands that which is unknown to us. 
And then you see verse 47 continues, and it says that he meant to pass by them. He meant to pass by them. Why? He's right there. He's, he's come at supernatural speed, just, just walking, and I picture him untossed, uh, completely dry as he does this in the midst of that storm, and he comes right up alongside that boat, and he can see them. He knows they're there, and he knows that they can see him, but it says that he meant to pass by them. Why? Well, you notice they still haven't called out to him. And so he comes right up along this boat. Now, make no mistake, he's not going to let them drown, all right? The, the, the totality of his plan is, is right there in that vessel. He's not going to let them sink, okay? But he wants to hear them cry out to him. And then we see in verse 49, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought he was a ghost. <laughs> and they cried out. And the word there for cried out is anakradzo, and it means... It's better translated, I think, to scream like a little girl. These grown men, these, these, these hardened, uh, seaworthy guys, these fishermen cry out like a little girl in, in sheer panic because they think he's a ghost. Sailors, I suppose, can be a little superstitious. Sometimes when we get caught up in a storm, we can revert to some superstitious things. We can believe some things that are not so. And he, they cry out in fear, but I love what comes next. It says, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus does not let them be in fear for long. And that's what we need to know. In your notes, in the storm, we must remember Jesus cares for us. Just because he wants you to learn something, that doesn't mean he doesn't care for you. It doesn't mean that He wants you to be in fear. He does not want you to be in fear. He wants you to know that He's there. He wants you to know that you can trust Him. This is why over and over we see in some variation the phrase fear not all throughout Scripture. This is why Christ comes in a vision to Paul in Corinth in Acts 18 and He says, do not be afraid. This is why He comes to Paul in Acts 23 and He says, take courage. When Paul's in jail, this is why He comes to Paul on a prison ship in Acts 27 and He says, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And He's saying to you right now, fear not. Don't be afraid. Wherever you are, His mercies are new every morning. And I love how this all wraps up. In verse 51, it says, And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased. When did the disciples experience peace? When did they experience the ceasing of the storm? It's when Jesus got into that vessel. Now, as his child, you are a vessel. You are inhabited by the Spirit of the living God. Jesus Christ, His Spirit lives in you. He resides in this vessel right here. And you, as a result, can know peace. It doesn't mean that there's not a storm going on outside that vessel. Around you, winds are blowing and waves are swirling and it's tumultuous and tempestuous. But inside, you know the peace of Christ because He is there with you and you are abiding in Him. That is what He wants you to know and that is what we must remember in the storm. I hope that's encouraging to you today. Now we are going to be posting on Monday a deeper dive with this story right here. You know, we have four Gospels and the beauty of having four Gospels is it's kind of like four vantage points on the same story at times. And in the book of Matthew chapter 14, there's another aspect that Mark does not address here in this chapter. And I'm going to take a look at that and we're going to glean more together. So I encourage you to check out uh, the deeper dive when we post that on Monday. Until then, we love you. You are in our prayers. Let me pray for us as we wrap this up. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for everybody watching today. I pray that you would indwell them, that you would invest in them your peace, that they would know it, that they would lay claim to it, and that they would be distinct from all others who are weathering this storm right now because they know the Prince of Peace. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great weekend.